spooky friends, and welcome to another episode of the Scariest Podcast. Woo! I'm Robin Grace, and this is Adam Diaz. Hello. And today we are celebrating Christmas. Are we celebrating today? I think actually, well, no, yeah, you're I right. Mean, I mean, it's Christmas Eve, but still. I mean, if you're listening to this on Christmas Eve, if you're listening to this on any other day of the year, this is the Christmas episode. This is our Christmas special episode. But I guess you are right, because we are recording it on December 24th at 1 a.m. in the morning, because <laughs> Christmas can be such a juggernaut on your schedule and demand so much time so you can do family stuff. So we hope that this episode brings you a little bit of joy in your me time, or you play this to make your family feel awkward or, or something like time. that. We time? That's pretty good. I like we yeah. time. That's cute. But, like Robin said, this is the Christmas special. I mean, so it's not covering... really special. It's like any other episode, but we're covering Christmas topics. It's Christmas themed, I guess. So we're going to be covering those Christmas topics. Uh, if you were looking to hear some homegrown horrors, you're on the wrong episode. You got to yeah, check Adam, out. Tell us what homegrown horrors are. You got to check out them story time episodes to hear homegrown horrors, which are spooky, paranormal, spiritual, sometimes coincidental stories that you folks, our dear listeners, have been nice enough to send into storytime at scarish dot com or any of our social medias to share with us so that we can share it. On the show, Robin, tell folks where they can watch us record those live. So, we have a YouTube, youtube.com slash scaryish, or twitch.tv slash scaryish podcast. Um, Twitch, you can, I mean, you can watch us live at both of them. We go live on both of them. So just, uh... When do we go live, Robin? Uh, Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. PM. Pacific Standard Time. Indeed, except for this Wednesday because it's Christmas and we're going to let you folks have your Christmas to yourself. We would also like our Christmas to ourselves. (laughs) Kind of, yes. So uh, Thursday, December 26th at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, you can listen to us record the episode of Storytime alive which is super fun some quick shout outs to do before we get into this episode we have pins enamel pins yeah hard enamel pins they're hard like hard enamel hof- pins yeah they're hopefully they're gonna be really nice i'm really excited um but if you folks go to our etsy store there's a link on our website scaryish.com you guys scroll down to the bottom it's my etsy store and i have the pre-orders up on there you guys can pre-order those maybe eat a little christmas gift for yourself um they will not ship probably until late January because I'm just waiting to hear from the manufacturer about when they're they'll be done but um I'm really excited so, so get those pre-orders those, yeah. in now cuz you get special discounts right now so right check on. it out perfect perfect timing so I think that's good I think we can go ahead and move into our christmas topics or our topics whatever you want to say uh so let's do it cool sound good yeah you you start <laughs> okay so this year I'm going first and uh, Robin and I talked over our topics a bit Last year, I was like 100% sure I wanted to do Christmas Miracles, and there were so many that when I was going through all these different top 10, top 7, top 29 lists, what? I had to leave a lot out. There's just weird top lists 29? That's all so over random. the internet. I know, it's really weird. Um, but that's the beauty of surviving another year as a podcast. I get to take another shot at it. I get to do some more. So once I heard that Robin was going to be covering uh, what she is covering... And if you're looking at the episode titles, you already know she's covering Christmas Murders. Murder. Uh, we got to talking a little bit about the order we wanted to do that. And so I was like, I think I should go first because the cycle of life is like good stuff happens. And then you can cover the end of the life cycle, which is brutal, vicious, bloody murders. <laughs> oh, my God. So she was like, no, you should go last. See, so we can end on a high note. I was like, nah, nah, nah. It's scaryish. I want to leave them on a yeah, cause we, little bit of a creepy so, note. Yeah, last year I covered Krampus, and then you covered the Miracles. Yes, second. So that we're still we're slip swapping. Wait, slip swapping is not a thing. Swapping? Hashtag slip swapping. Go ahead and start <laughs> oh tweeting God. that shit out. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and lead us off this Christmas with a few amazing stories that will leave you feeling uplifted. Maybe, in fact, one of these will make you feel quite the opposite. So to start, I'd like to let you folks know that if this is the first Christmas special you're hearing with Scarish that we did one last year, and if you're in the mood and you haven't heard it yet, uh, you can go ahead and check that one out after this one. I have this really nice intro in that episode about how my personal beliefs are not meant in any way to make anyone feel left out. It's quite the opposite. I celebrate Christmas, and I encourage you to celebrate whatever brings you joy, whether that's Festivus, Hanukkah, whatever you do you. So these stories all revolve around the 24th or the 25th because those are the dates of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So please just enjoy these fun stories that are not nearly as morbid and effed up as what Robin has in store for y'all. 
That said, let's jump into it. I'm going to do three stories of Christmas miracles. I hope you can hear my air quotes. I did them under the desk so Robin couldn't see them. Miracles. Not miracles. Not miracles. I don't know why Robin spelled it with a Y earlier, but we're like, <laughs> gold, frankincense, and miracles. Uh, anyways, one is going to be cute, one is going to be crazy, and one is going to be amazing. Huh. So I'm going to do them in okay. that order. Okay. So let's begin. You ready for some Christmas cheer? Because here it comes. We're starting with cute. As I researched the abundance of Christmas miracle stories, I kept seeing one pop up over and over on all those lists that I was mentioning. Is it about you? Because you're cute. No, it's not. But that's really sweet of you. I don't have my Christmas miracle story to tell. And again, if you didn't hear our Christmas special last year, go check that out because it does have a personal Christmas miracle story. <laughs> I'm going to have on there. my sister's Christmas miracle Are you, later. It's not as exciting as you would hope it no, would be. No, it's not. But it's so funny. Okay. So that said... uh, Finally, I was able to find some of the names that attached to the story I kept seeing over and over and the origin of the telling of the story. So the first time it was told, I cannot confirm that this is real. So take this one with a grain of salt. It could all be bullshit. But as a preview disclaimer, I will say the next two after this one are 100% confirmed. So we're going to start with the one that I don't have any physical evidence of, but I do have the original story. It starts in December of 1958, one Gertrude Albert of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Of course, when my freaking mic stand breaks and I don't have my pop filter anymore, I'm telling a story about Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Now you're just doing it on purpose. I know. Anyways, Gertrude Albert and her husband were working hard for the money, so you better treat her right. They had just purchased their own bakery and were putting their noses to the grindstone to make sure it was going to succeed. They had two children at the time, ages three and four. I could not find their name, so we shall refer to them as three and four. As some parents will do, they had their kids with them at their place of business many nights, and Christmas Eve was no exception. As they were closing up, three and four were fast asleep, Because kids sleep. It's what they do. They're like cats. Gertrude realized that although they had bought their children gifts, one thing had been forgotten due to the long hours at the bakery. Their children? A Christmas tree. Oh, I just said the children were at the bakery with them. So Gertrude and her husband scooped up their sleeping kids and started heading for places to buy a tree. And everywhere they went, they were told the same thing. No trees left. Now, as a side note, this to me... Seems like bullshit. I, know, I get because... that it's Christmas Eve, but even like tonight, which is the 23rd, technically rolling into the 24th, I guarantee There's you... There's still trees. Yeah. I could totally go find a Christmas tree, but... They might not be a cute tree, but... It's 1958. So maybe things are a little bit different. It wasn't as mass produced or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. So obviously this is going to be a different society, a different time they're living in, but they can't find a tree. And they're just like, all right, I guess we'll just head home. And on the way home, they're driving through town... And the weather started getting rough. I was about to start singing the song. I'm not going to do it. They were sitting at a red light, and things got kind of bad. And the wind started blowing around, started kicking up snow. And they're sitting at this red light. And all of a sudden, the family truck shakes because something has hit them during this whiteout. Please tell me it's a fucking tree. So, like, it clears up a little bit. And Gertrude's husband gets out of the vehicle to check and see what it is. And she can see him struggling with something in front of the tree until she feels something weigh the truck down because it hits the bed of the truck. And he gets in and he tells her, you guessed it, an evergreen tree had struck their truck, which is a really weird sentence. And they're like looking around and they're like, where did this tree come from? There's no trees lining the road. It must have been blown out of the lot of a local business that they just didn't go to. Yeah. And at this red light, the only business that's still open is on the corner. So they get out of their car and they go over to it and they ask the owner, hey, can we pay for your tree? It blew into the road, but we'd really like to buy one. The owner of the shop lets them know he doesn't have any Christmas trees on his lot and he didn't know what they were talking about. So they just shrugged it off, and they got back in the truck, and they took their super lucky, mega procrastination Christmas tree home. So they totally lucked out, and Gertrude claims to this day that they do not know where that tree came from and how it struck their car, but they all agree in their family that it was the most beautiful Christmas tree that they ever had. Aww. So I thought that was a really cute story, right? I'm not crazy. It's probably all lies, because I can't confirm any of it. 
But I kind of do like that story. And that's one you can, like, tell to your kids or your wholesome friends. As another side note, and this is speaking of trees, I don't know how many of you follow me personally on Instagram, but I posted a picture of the trees that grace the entrance of the subdivision across the street from ours. God. And they very much resemble giant cocks sticking up out of the ground. They basically wrapped the base of these trees, which are palm trees, the base of these trees in white lights, just continuous white lights, and then the bulb that's at the top of a pine or at the top of a what is it? What are they call palm tree? A palm tree is wrapped in red, so it looks like a shaft with a red tip, and then the leaves of the tree are not wrapped at all. So it looks like giant penises, giant erect penises erupting green splooge, which they need to get checked out because that's not healthy, and it's just absurd. So I post that on my Instagram. I went into work a couple of days later. And people at work were laughing about it because they're like, oh, we saw that thing on your Instagram and they're showing it to folks and everyone's laughing and they show it to like this older lady in the office and she sees it and she doesn't understand what the joke is supposed to be. So she's like, oh my God, that's such a beautiful tree. So we all like stop laughing and they put their phones away (laughs) and we're like, we're totally going to hell. But like this was a story that I could tell her at work and I think she would really like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's fun. So, we got that one out of the way, but now let's move on to the crazy one. We're going to get into our second story of the evening, and I want you to picture whatever wholesome person in your head represented the old lady from my work, because I'm sure everyone has a wholesome person in their life where they're like, oh, I can't swear around them, I can't show them any of these ridiculous things or these funny memes. Uh, So, picture that person and imagine how they would react to this story as I tell it. That's a fun exercise. We're going to fast forward to December 8th. 2007. And you thought I was going to jump straight to around Christmas time, didn't you? No. It's 10.15 a.m. New York, Upper East Side on December 8th, 2007. Two men are cleaning the windows on a skyscraper. Their names are Edgar and Alcide Moreno. And suddenly, there is a mechanical failure on their lift. And their lift falls. Edgar is thrown from the lift while Alcide is on the lift as it falls down the side of this building. So as this lift collapses, it's gaining speed as it plummets towards the earth, and at one point the lift shifts while it's collapsing, and it actually hits the facade of the building, which is apparently just like the face of a building. I had to Google it. It shatters a window, it turns end over end before smashing into the ground. Edgar was thrown clear off the lift and didn't have to endure the real-life Tower of Terror drop. And it's funny, because when I wrote that sentence, I thought to myself, how long of a drop is the Tower of Terror? You know what I mean? Like, how tall is it? So Tower of Terror or Guardians of the Galaxy, the max drop that you can experience from that. And I think it's cool because anyone's been on it. Like, those doors open and you see how high up you are. You're like, oh my god, I'm super high and I'm about to fall. Is that only like four stories? It's 131 feet. So 131 feet is pretty tall. Let's be real. Uh, These two brothers fell five hundred feet Jeez. so almost four times the distance of that ride so you may ask yourself how does that happen well they weren't anchored onto anything that they're supposed to be safety wise and there were new cables installed for the lift that hadn't been anchored properly either and no one's quite sure where the failure was the investigators suspect that it was something in particular wrong with the lift itself there are two distinct possibilities that they believe happened It all begins with them being literally on the top of this skyscraper. Uh, One was that they didn't tie off their safety lines, and as they began to lower down the lift, it suddenly collapsed, which is the most likely thing that could have happened. Uh, But they didn't have any of their equipment with them, and they were well known to be people that were adhering to the safety regulations. I think when you wash windows for a living on skyscrapers, that's not one of those things you're like, yeah, I'll save myself a couple of extra seconds and not tie off to my life-saving rope, you know? And they were known to do that. Uh, So the second option that the investigators realized was very possible is that they weren't on the scaffold at all. That it collapsed, and when it collapsed, all these cables broke off. And as these cables were whipping around the roof, they basically got pulled off the roof by the cables at the same time. That's some final destination shit. Yeah, one of the brothers was able to like land on the lift and grab onto the control box as he fell, and the other one was just launched clear off the roof. Oh my god. Which is just terrifying. Like, I cannot imagine seeing a lift collapse and having a cable drag me off the roof 500 feet into the air. Anyways, 
Back to the miracle. During Edgar's descent, he collided with a nine-foot-tall wooden fence that divided the property in an alley just before striking the ground. And you're probably thinking, collided how? Collided in the way that resulted in him being cut in half. So, side note, this is scarish. I gotta include all the gory details. He did die. Pretty obvious. Well, he got cut in half. He was I mean. cut in half. Uh, Alcide, however, crashed to the ground in this mangled mess of steel cables on this platform as it tumbled end over end after it shattered into a building window. Uh, he survived but was rushed to a nearby hospital. They listed him in grave condition. <laughs> like, I've heard of serious, stable, critical, but never grave condition. Um, they basically said he should be dead. They're shocked he's alive. They're taking him to the hospital. They don't expect him to live. I found the original article from when this happened before they would release any of the information on who it was yeah. and the extent of the injuries. And then I started finding more and more regarding uh, his injuries, which I will get to now. People were simply okay. baffled that he was alive. Uh, as soon as they got to the hospital, the doctors were like, you know what? This dude could use a coma. So they medically induced him into a coma so that his body could like not have the shock of the pain he was I'm going really through. I'm really curious about how those work because... I'm always like, why are they putting them into a medically induced coma? I know some are to help with maybe swelling and swelling stuff of like the that. Brain, yeah, typically, yeah. Um, but I, I'm just really curious how that works. You know, uh, medical people out there, let, let us, us know. know. His injuries were fairly limited. He had brain trauma and brain damage, damage to the spinal cord, broken spine, uh, broken chest, abdomen, fractured every rib, broke both of his legs, broke his right arm, but not the left one. They had to put a catheter in, which always sounds terrible, I think, to any guy in particular. Uh, ouch. But not like that. It was actually in his brain because the swelling was so severe they needed to drain the fluid constantly so he wouldn't die. He had clotting in his brain as well. Both of his lungs were collapsed. Both of his kidneys were damaged. This dude's fucked up. This dude fell 500 feet on a scaffold. Does he come out of this and become like an award-winning NFL player? Jeez. Some crazy... Let me just finish this. You're okay. going way too far off the deep end here. While he was in this coma, Alcide had a total of 24 pints of blood transfused into his body. That's a... The, how much does a human body do? Like four? Me, my next bullet points you're going to love. So, how much is 24 pints? It's three gallons of blood. We have like one of those water dispensers that has five-gallon jugs... Fill that 60% of the way, and that's how much blood they put into this dude. Uh, your question, how much blood does the human body have in total? Depending on the size of the body, the size of the person, some people, I don't know, have more juice in them than others. It's around 1.2 to 1.5 gallons. So at minimum, this dude was refilled from empty twice, that's which insane. is crazy. He had 16 separate surgeries over the course of 17 days Dude. to repair his shattered body. And even Imagine then, how much that cost. Even then, the doctors were like, they have no idea if he's going to have any of it work or if he's going to wake up and have any brain function because of the swelling and how severe it was. Can, they can measure the brain waves, though, right? They can tell if he They has... can check your brain activity, but when you're a medically induced coma, there's not a whole lot you can check, you know? So 17 days later, on December 25th, Christmas Day, he woke up from his coma. When he woke up, sitting next to his bed was Rosario Moreno, his wife, who never left his side. Aww. He was completely coherent. The only thing he didn't know when they asked him was the accident. He couldn't remember the accident. He showed no signs of brain damage. And although he would face a really, really long road to recovery... Literally no one still to this day has any idea how he survived at all. A uh, little bit of a follow-up on him. Seven years later in 2014, he did a 5K walk for charity. Wow. His time was under an hour, so he did it in 1830 per mile, which is pretty good for a walk. Uh, 2017, he would become a uh, dad for the fourth time, giving birth to his fourth son. Uh, Dr. Sheldon Tepperman, who is the director of trauma, stated this about the event. Which I think is pretty cool to know, because I always wonder what the survival rate is based on the height. 50% of people who fall, 4 to 5 stories die. So 4 to 5 stories, survival rate is 50%. Okay. By the time you reach 10 or 11 stories, just about everyone dies. This guy absolutely should have died, end quote. He fell 47 stories, and he lived, which is just incredible. Absolutely incredible, especially that on Christmas Day... He woke up and had all his faculties still, yeah. remembered absolutely everything, 
except for the accident. That is insane. And was like, I'm going to learn to walk again. No one's going to tell me otherwise. He did. Now he does walks for charity. I was researching on it, and after a lot of investigations going on, they determined that the failure was with the lift, and it wasn't anything that the brothers had done wrong. And he wound up with a huge cash settlement because it was it ruined his life. Yeah. Realistically, it destroyed his body. His brother did die. His brother was married with kids as well. And he has this huge cash settlement, and he's making sure that his life going forward has meaning because he does not know why he's still alive, just right. like everyone else. It's like it's mixture. Like, why did my brother die and exactly. I survive? Mixture of survival's guilt and a newfound sense of purpose. And in 2017, when he became a dad again, he thought the reason he's here was to make sure that this kid came into the world so he could raise him to be a good kid. And Aww, so when you read so stuff cool. like that, you're like, damn, dude, like this person has perspective that I do not have. And yeah. they do more <laughs> with a shattered body that's been recovered than I do because I haven't walked a 5K in ever. So. When I was reading this one, I was really moved by that. And then I read this next one. So I'm going to move on to the amazing one. So last year, I had a couple of stories about war. So there was a war that isn't talked about as much as other wars. I mean, I've heard about it. I don't know how many of you folks have. It's called the Korean War. And to make a long story short, at one point during the Korean War, the United Nations troops were ordered to retreat in the face of a massive force marching on their location, their location being, I'm going to try and say these things correctly, Hongnam, H-U-N-G-N-A-M. It's a city in northern Korea. They were to evacuate to Busan, which I know how to say correctly because of Train to Busan. So shout out to the folks who made that. When news like this hits and you have troops in your town and all of a sudden they're evacuating, the population tends to take notice. And it did eventually leak out that they were evacuating And they're thinking, oh, you're leaving? Well, we want to leave too. So the population of this city showed up to the docks. And most ships had already left by the time they got there. I think there was 182 ships in total. But they took who they could with the ships that were still there. The last ship to depart was the SS Meredith Victory. Its captain was a man named Leonard LaRue. And that is a solid fucking name, folks. Leonard LaRue, you just know this guy is going to be a badass. Okay. So kind of like Yukon Cornelius? Exactly. This is the Yukon Cornelius of the sea. So the SS Meredith Victory was designed to carry 12 passengers and a crew of 47. There were way more folks trying to evacuate at that time than roughly 60 people. Captain LaRue ordered his crew, rather than depart and be safe, to remove all weapons, which is kind of needed during war, and all supplies from the ship to make room for as many people as possible. Like to kind of lighten the load so they can carry more? And make space so they can fit people onto the boat because the boat's not that big. And they did. And they took all that shit off and they figured there was like different ways they can load people onto the boat now. They can get people in every corner of the ship. I will let you guess how many people they crammed onto this boat designed for 59 people. Uh... 500. More. What? Okay, uh, 750. More. 900? When they finally said, okay, we're full, they had loaded 14,000 Korean refugees onto this boat. This is 100% true. But the boat could only carry 60-something people? Correct. They were well below the line on the boat that tells you, like, if you start sailing this boat, you're probably going to sink. I don't remember what the line is right now. They were well below that, so they are just like, well, shit. We're going to try it. The captain was just like, we're not going to leave anyone behind if we if we don't have to. That is so cool. 14,000 Korean civilians boarded. It was so crowded, no one could even sit down. It was as jam-packed as you could possibly imagine. I'm imagining the Japanese subway. <laughs> yeah, the train where you're just like propped up. And you don't just, have to hold on to anything. <laughs> exactly. You're just packed in there, shoulder to shoulder. Busan was 450 sea miles away. The waters were filled with mines, and the ship had no method of detecting where they could be. There was one weapon left on board. Captain LaRue's sidearm. That is it. That is all they had in a time of war. They threw every other weapon off the ship just so they could fit folks on there. They departed at 11 a.m. on December 23rd. There was next to no food or water left because they had gotten rid of all of their supplies And people basically could not move. They are going to be standing. They're going to be as still as possible during this journey. I don't know if I mentioned this. During the daytime, it's around 32 to 35 degrees out. So when night hits, it's probably between 15 and 20 degrees. 
not counting the wind, you're on the deck of a ship as it's traveling with water hitting you as well. Imagine if one person had the zombie virus. Wow. Pretty sick. I mean, that would make for a really good movie, but I think what actually winds up happening here is an even better movie. So here's what winds up happening. The ship somehow manages to make it to Basan late on the night of December 24th, Christmas Eve. Upon arrival, the person at the dock in charge of bringing them in was like, Ooh, we have some bad news. You actually can't disembark anyone here. We're too full because they're the last ones there. And so they're like, only the people that are wounded can get off the boat. Everyone else has to stay on, which was almost all of them. Basically, they, they offloaded a handful of people. Everyone else had to stay on. And they're like, well, where do we go? And they're told they have to head to Koje Island. I looked up the pronunciation. It's not spelled anything like it sounds. And it's another 50 miles away. So they set sail again in really rough seas. And they arrive safely there on December 25th, Christmas and are finally able to start unloading folks. And according to Captain LaRue, quote, The risk of death or serious injury was great. The vessels pitched perilously in this swelling sea all through the unloading, the hulls banging and separating. They weren't unloading onto a dock. They were unloading onto another boat. And because they had, like, no equipment, they had two things. A pallet that you load shit on and a wench. Wow. That's it. That's what they made as a makeshift, like, disembarking vessel for them they could fit a grand total of 16 passengers at a time on this pallet that was lowered so for those of you who like math imagine loading 16 people onto a pallet operating this winch to lift it then lowering it in these conditions these rocky conditions with these boats smashing into each other on another boat letting those folks get off raising the pallet back up and doing it all over again so why were they dropping them off on another boat they're getting them off their boat. They've gotten them to safety. So that boat's going to take them to the mainland. Okay. So this is what they're doing. Imagine doing that 875 times. That's how many times they had to do that to get everyone off of their boat. That's an insane amount of people. And to keep that ship without anything crashing and anything damaging and anything sinking is a miracle in and of itself. The disembarking didn't even get completed until December 26th. It took almost a full day for them to do this. During the trip... The death toll for folks on that boat during time of war in these conditions was exactly zero. Wow. Not a single person died. During the trip, the first mate, D.S. Savisto, I think I'm saying his name right, was the only person there trained in basic first aid aside from the captain. So he was basically designated the doctor. He had to deliver five babies during the journey oh my god all of whom survived so they left with fourteen thousand. they arrived with fourteen thousand and five. <laughs> they all lived this is seriously a christmas miracle if there ever was one i'm completely bo- blown away on this one and i have some amazing follow-up info on this which i think is the coolest stuff i've ever heard first koje is korean for great rescue the name of the island is great rescue that they was wound it up going named to. that it was already that? named that for historical purposes two years later after this operation completed two of the refugees from that boat uh who stayed there would have a baby and name him moon jn and if that name sounds familiar it's because he's the current president of south korea shot up. He was born on Shut Koje up. Island. I had chills. That's one hundred percent true. The no United way. States Department of Transportation, when this happened, declared the evacuation by the SS Meredith Victory quote the greatest rescue in the history of mankind. People don't even bother disputing this because it's so unlikely to have succeeded. The Guinness Book of World Records has it listed as the largest evacuation from land by a single ship. And you'd be hard-pressed to find any ship that could fit that many folks on it. Not to mention the fact it was designed for 59 people, which is insane. The crew was awarded the Meritus Service Medal, the highest honor that can be bestowed on a merchant marine. There were merchant marines. It's like people think of all these different parts of the armed forces... And folks don't really think of merchant marines a lot. We talked to Ralph about it, one of our special guests, because Ralph was a merchant marine. These folks that did this were merchant marines. They're like, get rid of all the guns, 
put 14,000 people on this boat. We're going to do this. Did they just chuck their guns into the ocean? They literally were just like, we don't have space for this. I can't be pressed that close. We're keeping one gun on the boat just in case someone's a zombie. So clearly they had (laughs) your idea in mind too. Okay. And Captain LaRue, he commanded the SS Meredith Victory until 1952, two years later, when it was decommissioned. He then relocated to New Jersey. This is 100% true. Where he became a Benedictine monk. What? He lived until October 14th, 2001. I think he wound up being around 92 years old. And the last thing I'll tell you about this particular thing. On March 25th, 2019, this year, Bishop Arthur Saratelli officially opened the canonization cause for Leonard to make him a LaRue saint. to make him a saint. That's crazy. And the thing about becoming a saint is you have to... They have to confirm three miracles that you perform That's three miracles. Be one of them. And when you have something like this, you're like, okay, well, one is done. <laughs> Let's get the other two. Because uh, it's just so unbelievable that something could have gone like this. And like when you read the stuff that he said about the evacuation, it's really, really moving. So if there's something that you can take away from this part of this episode, go check out the evacuation that happened on this island Christmas of 1950 and Captain LaRue and see the things that he had to say about it because it's not like he was silent about it when he was a monk. He would talk about it and it's just absolutely amazing. He changed his name to Brother Marinus, which I think is pretty cool because Marinus, obviously, Marine, like that's where it comes Uh, from. Yeah. So that's three. That is what I have for you this holiday season, Spooky Friends. One last thing. I said this last year and I'll say it again. I love Christmas. I absolutely love Christmas. I love Christmas time. I love this season. I love that the purpose of it is to go out of your way to be kind and thoughtful and caring and to bring joy to people that you care about or people you've never met. Even if you can't afford much, going out of your way means so much to so many people. And lots of us have family or friend gatherings that we attend and not everyone feels the way I do. In fact, a lot of people don't. And a lot of people think Christmas is a time to make their friends or their family miserable. And let's be real. Those people suck. Oh my God. And you are never obligated to submit yourself to the abuse of someone else simply because they think you should tolerate their nonsense. So if you have to deal with folks like that this holiday season, just avoid them as best as you can. And if they force you to interact with them, take over the conversation and tell them one of these stories, possibly the most morbid one to make them uncomfortable or possibly one of the stories Robin is about to tell us right now. So that my spooky friends was my second installment of Christmas miracles. Cool. Thank you. That was really neat. That I can, last one blew that my last mind. One, yeah. Is that's insane. I was reading this and like, how have I never heard of this? And the more research I did, I kept finding more and more and more on it. Once I knew the keywords I needed to search, it just blew up my research. And I was just so overjoyed to find all of it. It was amazing. So I hope you folks enjoyed that. Yeah. Before we move on into Robin's topic, we are going to take a quick break for some ads, so please stay with us. <laughs> and we're back. Thank you for being with us. Just so you folks know, if you're like, man, these ads are a little bit annoying, for a dollar a month, you don't have to worry about the ads. Go over to patreon.com slash podcast. If you sign up for any of our tiers, you get these episodes free of ads there's still going to be the break and a weird two second pause but then you come right back so something that we offer now which i think is pretty cool cool so i'm gonna let you go ahead and take the floor and tell us about these really fun super happy christmas murders well for those uh for those breaks on the patreon do you keep in those weird noises that i make oh yeah all the time no you don't yeah why would i take them why would i get rid of those of course i keep that why would i get rid of that it's gold oh i didn't know that okay cool uh, so before I get into my super crazy topic, I just wanted to share a stupid thing that happened to me and my sister tonight, <laughs> because we had our Christmas party at our family's house, and, um, it was just so funny, because I have had my sister's, she had, like, a thermoflask, you know, at my house for a really long time, um, a couple weeks at least, and when she left it, I was like, ah, she'll be back for it, she knows it's here, you know, and so I just kept it and I didn't text her because I figured out she'd be back. And tonight I remind her like, hey, you know, you have your because I went to get a glass of water or something. And I tell her like, hey, you know, you have your thermoflask or whatever at my house. Right. And she's like, 
what? <laughs> because apparently she had called all these different places she'd been to, like the gym or I think to Boot Barn at school. She'd <laughs> called all these places to ask if they've seen this big, you know, jug that she carries around. It's with an her enormous everywhere. thermal flask. It's huge. If she was ever attacked, she could literally I, murder someone with this thing. I used it for work today and it was just, I felt like a baby holding a big baby bottle to my face because it was giant. And uh, it's just, she loves this thing. It has all these stickers of things that she loves on it. It is covered in her fandoms. Yeah, it's just, it's so her. And I just thought it was so funny that this whole time she was like, this thing that I love is gone forever. (laughs) And so when I told her, like, you know, I have this thing of yours, she's like, oh my god, I'm so glad you have it. And (laughs) I'm just like... Merry Christmas. It's your Christmas miracle. <laughs> What's funny to me is that this Christmas miracle could have been so easily avoided, if that's the right word, if you would have just texted her like, hey, you know you left your thermo flask or here. She could have texted, or hydro flask here. She could have texted me and been like, hey, have you seen my bottle? But you, she went out of her way to call all these different companies. You two are the most bizarre people I've <laughs> ever met. I was telling her this in the car. Who would not text someone just to let them know they left something behind? And who would not text the most likely candidate for where they left their thing? It's just... And she said, oh, I knew I was going to come over there for Christmas, so I was hoping it might be there. It's like she made this her last hope when it was her (laughs) most obvious hope at the same time. Like, everywhere she went was just building her up for disappointment to set her up for this Christmas miracle that it's like you guys manufactured through poor communication and reasoning. It's just so funny. It was so funny when she was telling me this in the car. I was like, are you really going to call us a Christmas miracle? She's like, yeah, I am. (laughs) Okay, okay, so... This next thing, all these things I'm about to talk about, uh, we're going to take like a whole, what is it called? An 180? Yeah? Yeah. That's the amount of angles that goes to the opposite side? Okay. Out of amount of degrees, angles. I don't care. It it's doesn't late. matter. It's 2 a.m. Um, holy shit, it's 2 a.m. Okay. So last year we ended on a high note with the Christmas miracles. This year we're changing Bring it up. Bring it down a notch. Yep. <laughs> oh, God. Miracles. And murder. Murder. Um, This year, I'm covering a few different cases, the first of which is that of the Anderson Family Massacre. Oh, my God. uh, Also known as the 2007 Carnation Murders. And uh, what ties us into Christmas, you might ask? Well... Let's get started. Wow. <laughs> shout- Rosanna Pincino yeah, is going to go ahead and sue out. us now. Um, I have all her cookbooks. She's great. She's so freaking adorable. I did not know she was so tiny. How tiny is she? Like like Marsha Tiny. Wow. Yeah, tiny. We have a friend named Marsha who's 5'2". So yeah, if you're 5'2", two, we would also consider you tiny, but not in an offensive way. No. <laughs> um. All right. So on December 24th, 2007, so on Christmas Eve... Near the town of Carnation, Washington, which is a small town 25 miles east of Seattle, the brutal murders of the Anderson family occurred. Uh, which is rough. I mean, this is fucking Christmas Eve, okay? Um, the culprits were Joseph McEnroe and his girlfriend, Michelle Kristen Anderson, who were both 29 at the time, which is crazy that they were younger than me. Uh, McEnroe was a store clerk and Anderson was unemployed. <laughs> They had met online, McEnroe apparently having decided that he was going to move in with her before they had even met in person. It's creepy. That is pretty creepy. That's a weird decision to make unless, I don't know, this is taking place in 2007, you said, right? Yeah. I mean, the internet age is well kicked off at that point. They might have known each other really well before they met. It's not as crazy as it sounds. It's still moving rather quickly. It's like, you have to go through some stages... Before you should get to, let's move in together, let's murder people together. Um, Witnesses said that they fought all the time. That's not It was just an unhealthy relationship between the two of them. So, I don't know, it's just, maybe, I don't know, get to know each other, date for a couple years, and then decide you want to live together. Then decide if you want to kill people together. Um, Oh my god. Okay, so, according to court documentation, McEnroe and Anderson armed themselves prior to their arrival at the Anderson family home, where Michelle's father, who was a Boeing engineer, her mother, who was a postal worker, were residing. So, 
I mean... Pretty good job. Yeah. Her brother, sister-in-law, and niece and nephew arrived after the death of the parents, having hoped to be celebrating the holiday. And uh, her parents, Wayne and Judy, were 60 and 61, respectively. They were home. Wayne was in the living room while Judy was in another room wrapping gifts. And at around 4 p.m., Michelle just came blazing in. And according to her testimony, she was, quote unquote, tired of everybody stepping on her. So uh, she came blazing in, was tired of everybody stepping on her. Apparently, her brother hadn't paid her back for money that he'd borrowed years before, and her parents weren't supporting her in her argument that he had to pay her back. She was also stressed and upset that her parents were beginning to pressure her to pay rent while living in a trailer on their five-acre property. So she and her boyfriend had been living there rent-free for a year, mind you. And she was getting upset that now they had to pay rent. So this is what triggers the idea of, I should go kill everyone? I guess so. She claimed that, quote, she was upset with her parents and her brother, and that if the problems didn't get resolved by December 24th, then her intent was definitely to kill everybody, end quote. Wow. It's a really weird thing well, okay obviously it takes a deranged mind to decide i'm going to murder people let alone your family it takes an even more deranged mind to set the date of like i'm gonna go with christmas eve christmas eve sounds like a right like a round solid number for me to pick those are in the court documents so that it was said at some point you know holy crap the king county prosecutor dan satterberg stated that the events began with wayne her father so michelle attempted to shoot her father And then she either missed or the gun jammed. And so McEnroe, her boyfriend, went to distract Judy. But upon hearing the shot, they both ran into the room. And then McEnroe ended up shooting both of them. Um, Supposedly, he apologized to Judy before he shot her. So That makes it better. uh, Both were fatal gunshots to the head. So this is pretty brutal. Good God. (laughs) Um, Apologizing before you shoot someone is just like... The maximum level of saying no offense and then being really shitty after that. <laughs> oh my god! I've it never just makes even you a really, like really shitty person to do Holy that. Holy crap! And if you were to dial that knob all the way up to eleven, it would be I'm sorry, and then killing someone. Oh right my afterwards. god! I have never. I'm not even thought saying of it like that. everyone that says no offense and then something shitty afterwards is a bad person. Usually, I say something really shitty and then say no offense. <laughs> What's funny is the only person I've known who would do this consistently is Garrett, my friend who's been the most supportive of the podcast and listens all the time. And right now he's probably like, are you calling me a fucking murderer? (laughs) Okay. So Satterberg stated that in the following 30 to 45 minutes afterwards, they dragged the bodies to a shed behind the home and covered up the blood with towels and blankets. And then they waited. So they freaking waited for the rest of the family to arrive. And I don't know how anyone shoots two people and then sits there knowing that their bodies are in the back and they're just waiting to kill more people you know what i mean they had to wait for these people to arrive and upon the arrival of her brother sister-in-law and their kids uh, michelle shot her brother between two or four times as he charged her upon seeing the gun and then she continued on to his wife, Erica, shooting her twice. She was able to call 911 before the phone was taken away from her. And I think the batteries got taken out or something like that. Um, she huddled with her children and then begged them to leave them be. And she just said, quote unquote, you don't have to do this. And according to McEnroe, the boyfriend, his response was, yes, we do. Wow. Before shooting her fatally. And that's not the worst of it. There, it gets so much worse because the murder... So I guess it's a trigger warning for anyone who wants to skip ahead a little bit. Yeah, if you guys want to skip past, I mean... Let's be real. Most of the folks who listen to this are like, (laughs) tell me the horrible details so I can turn it up at a stoplight and freak out everyone next to me. Oh my god. So the the murders obviously don't end there. The two children, six-year-old Olivia and three-year-old Nathan, were trying to call for help, which unfortunately never came. Uh, McEnroe claims that he apologized to the children before killing them as well. And he stated, quote, I didn't want them to turn us in, end quote. Whereas Michelle had a slightly different idea. She claims, quote, it was a combination of not wanting them to have to live with the memories and not wanting there to be any witnesses, end quote. So it was selfish and thoughtful for them at the same time. It's just straight up heartless because 
I don't know what excuse you think is reason enough to kill children. There, that's the that's her niece and nephew. Yeah, I I mean, and if you've been living there for a year, you've seen them come and go. You know what I mean? It's not like you've had no relationship with these fucking children. It's just oh my god, it's horrific. Yeah, um, I just I, you don't kill children because you're you feel bad for them. You know, it's to cover up your loose ends. I, I get that her boyfriend did it, but she let him do it. She like encouraged um, this to she, happen. This she, is her yeah plan. She even told detectives that he did it because she asked him to, which is so messed up. Um, after the killings, they drove out to go back home locked the gate behind them, which prevented the deputies from checking the property when responding to that 911 call. So I have no idea why that would stop police officers from going, but, um, I mean, it's five acres. It's a huge property. You know what I mean? It's really big, but, I mean, you would know where that house is. The idea that, oh, the gate's locked, everything must be fine, does not seem like something that would come from a deputy. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, the two drove to Canada and eventually decided to drive back and pretend to discover the bodies. When Judy's best friend Linda went to check on them two days later, since Judy had been missing from work, she came across this massacre. Um, by the time McEnroe and Anderson returned, authorities were already on their property and began questioning them. And they didn't seem at all phased by the turn of events. They didn't ask what happened. They didn't ask why there's so many cops here. They were just really, really suspicious. So what the murderers claimed was that they were heading to Las Vegas, but decided to come back when they'd gotten lost. Um, They were arrested and eventually did confess, stating that they had planned the killings for weeks. So obviously it's premeditated. They went and they bought these handguns. You know what I mean? It's just, ew. Um, What's crazy about it is she made the ultimatum that if things don't get better by Christmas, I'm killing everyone. But she never told anyone there was an ultimatum. But then she went out and bought the guns and planned the murder. She could have shown up. Her brother could have been like, I got your rent for you. Sorry about that. Her parents could have told her, you can go ahead and stay on our property and don't have to worry about rent. Yeah. I feel like she still would have killed these people. So, you don't premeditate that far in advance with that much rage and then just let that shit go. I feel like she wasn't making any attempt to make her life better, though, because she's living on this property rent free and she's unemployed and she's not making any effort to go out there. And do she was just making sure she had a scapegoat to blame for all of her problems. It's it just like. crazy. McEnroe confessed to the murders in January of 2014. And then on December 19th, 2014, he went to trial and during the trial, apparently, he had multiple breakdowns. He would start humming. He would start making jokes and giggling. He would even say things like, just kill me. I did it. Um, and apparently, he, he did this weird thing where he always whispered. That's just how he talked. So everyone had to keep asking him, like, can you repeat that? over and over and over again. I feel so bad for the court reporter of that trial. Yeah. My mom listening to this right now is like, that <laughs> poor, poor court reporter. Um, On March 25th, 2015, the jury found him guilty of aggravated first-degree murder on all six counts, and he was sentenced to life. On March 4th, 2016, Michelle uh, Anderson was also found guilty on all six counts and sentenced to life. And she... Never made an attempt at any insanity plea. She even refused to be evaluated for it. Uh, Not unsurprising is the fact that they totally turned on each other during their individual trials. Oh, I bet. Oh, yeah. Anderson made McEnroe out to be the aggressor, where McEnroe made Anderson out to be the master manipulator. Um, Both are without the possibility of parole, so they're stuck in there. Good. Uh, The next one is a bit on the ridiculous side. I thought I'd throw a little funny. Not really funny. But one that just, uh, I think everybody can kind of relate to or understand. Uh, A murder? (laughs) No, no, not the murder part. But just, okay. So let let me just get into it. Okay. So it's 1894. Amy and John Johnston, which why anyone would name their son John. John Johnston. (laughs) Yeah. Is beyond me. And they were hosting a Christmas dinner party. They invited their friend Daniel Heron and his wife and their friend George castle everything was going fine and dandy until there was just a little too much drunk to go around uh as drunk conversations may do sometimes old grievances were brought up that turned into a shouting match between daniel and john and then at around 7 p.m 
Daniel decided to draw a gun, aiming it at John, and what the argument could have possibly been over, I really, really wonder. But then I think maybe back then everybody kind of just whipped out a gun whenever they were upset. I mean, back then. I'm pretty sure that's standard operating procedure right now still. (laughs) Well, when I get upset, I don't whip out a gun. You don't have a gun. There's so many people that still behave like this is the Wild West. Damn, look at them guns. She flexed for those of you who aren't watching. I have no Which would be literally everyone but me. (laughs) Okay, so. (laughs) I would guess, and I'm just putting this out there, it was about some sort of romance that had gone wrong and one person had been responsible for breaking the other person's heart. They're drunk and they're talking about stuff right now. It could have been like, you stole Susie from me in third grade. You're going to fucking die. You don't know because they're drunk. Anyway, Amy jumped to her husband's defense and ended up being the one that got shot in the process. Oh, no. It's like a shitty movie. Yeah. (laughs) I'm sure she was like, no. Yeah, you can just see that scene where she runs (laughs) over. Uh, Okay, so I this is not funny because this is really, it happened in real life, okay? But we just have to kind of go with it, I guess. Daniel sobered up pretty darn quick and ran back to his house, where he was then arrested. Amy did die of her injuries. Wow. I mean, it's a murder, so obviously. Right. And Daniel was convicted of manslaughter. So what's sad is that things like this probably still happen. And that's what I thought, like, this is so relatable to people because people get drunk. They argue, fights break out, and police end up responding to crazy amounts of domestic violence during this season. We talked to one of your family members about what to expect during this season, particularly during Thanksgiving. What do you expect to see most during the night shift or whatever? Right. And they said, oh, it's totally domestic. Yeah. Domestic disturbance, by far. People get drunk. They start to fight over old stuff just like this. Yeah. It's been over 100 years since this happened, and holiday get-togethers still drive people crazy. That's why I say do whatever you can to avoid your toxic family or friends, and if you are forced to interact with them, talk about something that makes you happy or entertain, and then they'll just leave you be. Yeah. I I mean, just uh, try not to get into those types of situations. Yeah. Okay. So this next one both pisses me off and freaks me out just a little bit. In 2011, the body of a 67-year-old Michelle O'Dowd of Jacksonville, Florida, was found to have been beaten and strangled and then hidden under the Christmas presents. Wow. Holy shit. Right? Like, I'm sorry, but that's just messed up on multiple levels. Multiple levels. That's just why. Um, her body was discovered when her twin brother, Phil, went to go check on her because she'd missed work and he was understandably concerned. They're twins. Um, oh snap, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Dang. Twin powers activate or deactivate. That's so sad. Oh, dude, now I'm depressed. Thank you for that. Well, I mean, all this stuff is really depressing, but O'Dowd lived in a gated community, low to non-existent crime, but when he saw that her front door was open, he knew immediately that something was wrong. Uh, The house had been tossed over. Um, I don't know if that's the right phrasing. What is it? Looked it's just tossed. Picked over, tossed. Um, He checked through each room, calling out to her, and then he noticed something sticking out from under the tree. This is so sad. Holy shit. Yeah. It was her foot. And not only was she covered in the gifts, but her face was covered in a towel, and then there was a vodka bottle that was laying nearby, seemingly propped there purposefully by the killer. Um, There has to be something about the towel covering the face as some psychologic thing. Um, Is it that... There, it's a sign of guilt or something. I thought guilt immediately, yeah. Uh, I think when I looked it up, it meant that the murderer had an emotional attachment to them or something. But if there are any uh, people that specialize in this stuff, please let us know. We're, we're always curious to learn more things. Her dog and car were still present at the home. So it's not like someone was there to steal stuff. So that dog was there and still alive. I yeah. can't imagine. Like, I know what our dogs are like when we come home. The level of frantic that they are, I can't imagine what a dog would be like after something like that happened. Yeah, but but the car was still there, so they weren't there to steal, because imagine how much you could sell the car for. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, The night before the discovery, Michelle had been talking to a family member about a friend visiting, and that friend was Patty Michelle White. She was, which is funny because they have like the same name in there. 
One's Michelle O'Dowd, one's Patty Michelle. It's, right. it's confusing. It was very confusing for me when I first started researching all this stuff. So uh, Patty was 37 at the time and was living with O'Dowd's nephew in South Carolina. So they were dating. And they uh, the family had known her for four to five years by then. And then they broke up. And Patty was obviously still welcomed. They were dating for a while, you know what I mean? Right. Um, so O'Dowd invited her to stay with her rent-free for a whole month. And the whole family helped her by giving her odd jobs and money when she needed it. Uh, they paid her to babysit or help clean houses, things like that. Uh, for all intents and purposes, she was part of the family. You know, she was a family friend. And it seemed like it was this whole thing was just a way to get into all the personal information for this big thing that she was going to do, you know? She knew all of O'Dowd's pins for her credit and debit cards. Um, she would go and get groceries for the two of them. She knew the gate code to the neighborhood, obviously. And she knew the details of O'Dowd's life and daily activities. So she kind of got her way into this woman's life and, and was totally taking advantage, you know? After the murder, O'Dowd's debit card was used at two different ATMs with $500 withdrawn from each. And both cameras allowed for the positive ID of Patty White as the one using the card. What was her end game to this? Like, what was the long con on? I don't understand why you would murder someone for a thousand dollars at an ATM you're not even hiding your face at. Yeah. She was caught the next day in South Carolina, supposedly trying to flee. And she did eventually confess to the murder, claiming that it was just supposed to be a robbery. So something must have gone horribly wrong, you know, and she just had to. Uh, I mean, you never just have to. So what was the cause of death? I don't know if we um, got to that. We did. It was uh, strangulation and uh, blunt force trauma. Okay. Yeah, she was beaten and strangled. Um, so White pleaded guilty to second-degree murder on October 14th, 2013, and was sentenced to 45 years in prison, uh, over $1,000. She was murdered over a measly thousand dollars it's just so bizarre it's just yeah like what the f so dumb uh what's even more messed up about this particular murder is neighbors heard screaming and wailing and no one ever thought to call the police um i think it's a good time now (laughs) to point out that christmas can be trying for a lot of people and not everyone has a picture perfect hallmark christmas Also, I mean, not everyone even celebrates it, and it's just another day. This person obviously needed help. Right. You know? And it was just, it's, it's, all this stuff is insane. I don't understand, like, okay, it's really difficult for me to picture a scenario where I don't hear someone screaming bloody murder and not do something, you know? Like, if I hear a noise at night, I check the time. Because I'm like, if that was a gunshot, I want to remember what time I heard it at. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can't imagine neighbors hearing someone, they literally heard someone being murdered and they didn't do anything. Except after the fact, when someone asked them, did you hear something on this night? They're like, oh yeah, it sounded like someone was being murdered. I did nothing. Yeah. I just, it's so easy to pick up the phone, call 911 and say, hey, I think I hear something. And if it's an all clear, then at least you know, you know? Yeah. And it's, I can't fathom that yeah uh if this person this uh patty white needed help so badly she could have just asked someone not murdered someone for a thousand dollars you know what i mean and i get it obviously not everyone is going to be able to have the christmas where they buy gifts for everyone or they don't have a whole bunch of people in their lives to get them gifts. Um, like I said, not everybody even celebrates this holiday. And some people are just struggling to get by. You know what I mean? Um, Can you imagine being... I, I mean, I just can't. And I don't want to like try and have people imagine this. But I don't have the ability to empathize or sympathize with someone who sees a human being that is taking care of them and helping them. And does everything to make them a better person and to make their world better. And looking at that person like a target. That yeah. should be the person that you want to be on the same side as and protect and do things to to reciprocate those feelings. Right. And there are people in the world who look at folks like that who have the ability to take their strength 
and project it to someone else and they see that as a weakness and it's something that should be exploited and aside from the fact the murder is absolutely brutal and horrific that is the most sickening part of this yeah. one to me uh, i think we should all be kind and patient not just for the holiday but kind of try to be that type of person every day and i know it's something silly and i'm sure people say that all the time but like i just think this time of year especially uh be there for each other you know like we all need a little help sometimes and just a little pick me up maybe just like a hey how you doing something like that um can change someone's day could maybe help someone not murder someone else so it's weird because I watch sports ball a lot, as some folks call it. I watch a lot of different types of sports, and there's something that's... I was like, sports ball? What the F is sports I was talking ball? about football at work today, and someone's like, do you watch sports ball? Which is just a nerdy way of saying, like, do you watch or participate in the fandom of sport? Oh, okay, And for me, it's it. like, yes, I am super nerdy, but I'm also super into sports. Um, the reason I bring this up is because there's something in games that happens a lot, or even in seasons... Uh, that people look at, and it's a team's momentum. And things can shift very quickly in any game where all of a sudden, no matter what the score is, one team has momentum, and it's something that's not quantifiable, and you just feel it. And you see it, and things change based off of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And random acts of kindness, or just deliberate acts of kindness, can change the momentum in someone's in that moment and in that day and in that week or in that month or literally in someone's life where people can look back and say, I didn't know it at the time, but this really changed everything about how a specific event was going to go that could just lead to a cascade of good things happening to someone. It's just amazing to be part of something like that. And it doesn't take much at all. Just to be like, if you're a good person, just be a good person and you'll bring that into other people's lives. And I think that's just the the perfect example of why I like Christmas so much. It's like everyone has this idea of, let's do that. Let's try and do that for each other. And so, yeah, I just want to put that out there because I know that the Christmas murder part was very, very morbid. <laughs> but super interesting. It was fantastically researched as well. So great job. Thanks. I think you're really, really good at true crime. I love murder. I think you're... Wow, that's a creepy thing. I mean, I love researching murder if i disappear i want everyone to remember episode 107 needs to be played for the judge i mean no you know what i mean it's just like it's something that totally intrigues me because i just can't the fact that these people have in their minds that this is okay blows my mind and it just is something that i think is so interesting and um scary at the same time so yeah I agree. It's kind of, I don't know. Scary-ish. scary-ish. Yeah, I was going there. So, But I think that's a pretty good Christmas special. It is kind of sad at the end, but it was pretty fun. I think and we should so go many, back to the miracles. <laughs> so many folks are so interested in true crime, and I know that overlaps so well with our audience because so many of you posted your top five from Spotify podcasts, and it's amazing to see the company yeah, that our podcast is so in. Yeah, so much. I cannot believe how many of you have us as your top five. It was pretty amazing to see all those start rolling in, and uh, it definitely made me feel really great to know so many folks listen to these huge podcasts that we also listen to. Yeah, I cannot and believe And then it. us mixed in, so it yeah, was... Yeah, well, we, so many of you were, like, listening to us among things like... Ma Bim Bam, yeah, or, or My, my Favorite, favorite Murder, murder. And I'm like, or Adventure oh Zone. So thank you so much, you guys. You guys are awesome. And uh, we hope we can bring some of what we feel from you into your lives as well. So if we do, fantastic. And we want to thank you guys one last time for uh, everything you do for us. Like Robin said, that's about the end of episode 107, the second Christmas special that we've had. I we cannot hope, believe it. I know. I think it's technically the third. We started the podcast in 20... Today's This is 2019. So we started in 2017, I think, in December. So I don't know if we did anything special for our first Christmas. So. No. But it would have been like episode five. So yeah. uh, this was really fun to do. We hope you folks enjoyed it. If you have a story you want to send us, regardless of what it could be about Christmas miracles, spooky things happening, true crime, you can email storytime at scarish.com or go over to our website, scarish.com, and click on contact us or hit us up on any of our social media. It's facebook.com slash scarish podcast. Tweet at us at scarish pod or message us on Instagram at scarish podcast. You can also join our Discord. Best way to do that, 
go to the website. On the right-hand side, there's little buttons that are links to all of our social medias. Just click on the one for Discord. It'll take you straight to our server. And we hope to see you there. It's a really fun time. Robin, for folks who wanted to donate to us monetarily and get those ads gone, how can they do so? You folks can go on over to patreon.com slash scarish podcast. And those are monthly donations. There's a whole bunch of different tiers. You guys can go and check it out. We got the ad-free episodes for the absolute first tier, if you guys want to just do that. But and we have all like, the other ones as well. Yeah, we have a whole bunch of um, physical tiers, too. And and as you go up, you get everything from the previous tiers. So it works that way. And then we have coffee, ko-fi.com slash scarish podcast. And those are one-time donations. It all goes to helping us improve our studio setup, which is great because we're starting to do a little bit more with the streaming thing and all that stuff. Um, And then our Etsy shop. Please go to our Etsy shop. That is the place where we have the physical merch that we have here. It's We have coasters and stickers. Um, and then I am in the process of manufacturing hard enamel pins of the new little mascots that we have that represents me, Kitty Cat, and Adam, the skeptical one. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so what what noise was skeptical that? Skeptical bear. That's okay. the skeptical bear noise. <laughs> oh mm. All right. Um... <laughs> Okay. Anyway, uh, hopefully they turn out really cute. I'm really excited. It's the first time I've ever uh, designed something like that. So I'm really, really stoked. So you guys can pre-order those on our Etsy shop. Um, And yeah, I think that's it, right? I think so. So that is everything that we have for you folks for episode 107. Thank you for listening. We're going to be on the story time. We're going to be on (laughs) Thursday, 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for story time number 98. So if you want to join us, it's not Wednesday this week. It will be Thursday. That's just about everything we got. So, Robin, go ahead and sign us out. Keep on creeping on, and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye.